Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. And we're going to look at verses 1 to 4 in this lesson this morning on a call to humility. Father, I do pray that you will help us this morning. I know that I personally am in need of your grace. I know that um, many times we are distracted from things that, have, things that are going on at home with our husband or our children or even this morning, Lord, I'm, I'm weighed down heavy for many that um, I know that are, are hurting and suffering because of other people's sins and my mind is going to them and I want to leave that at your feet and be able to concentrate on the one thing that's needful right now and that is to communicate this passage in a way that is clear and is true to your word. And so, Father, I pray that you'll give grace not only for me but for these women as well because I know that they too are carrying burdens and their minds are easily distracted. I thank you, Father, that you remember that we are frail, that we are dust. And Lord, that um, you understand our infirmities, you understand our weaknesses. Help us to overcome those even now, Father, that we might focus on the one thing that is important right now, and that is to study these four verses. And to not only study them, Lord, but to obey them. That's the most important thing, to obey so, Father, give grace, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, one of the blessings of being a teacher of God's Word is not only that I get to practice living out what I'm getting ready to teach, but also the Lord many times gives me live illustrations to further uh, explain what I'm going to teach on. And this particular lesson, He did. I happened to be with three other women, and the four of us were sitting around talking, and we were all talking about a wedding that was coming up in about, I think it was two days from that time. And one of the ladies at the table said this, boy, why does that wedding have to be in the middle of the day? And she went on to say that it messed up her whole day, because it was a Saturday that the wedding was taking place on. Another one of the ladies looked at me and she said, what a selfish society we have become. And then she said to the first lady who said what she said, the wedding is not for you. It's for them and it's to honor their day. And then I said, thank you for a great introduction for my lesson to Philippians 2, 1 to 4. <laughs> now, Ladies, I am not so pious as to think that we all do not struggle with behaving selfishly at one time or another, right? In fact, just this morning, my husband called me. Debbie can know because I was driving here, and uh, he, wanted to know, he always calls me several times a day, usually when I'm out of town, how'd it go and everything. And, you know, we're getting ready to move, and right now I have this big office with a big desk, and we put it on Craigslist, and he said, someone's coming this morning to get it. And I said, well, you will, you know, take my computer off and put it on the floor and my printer. I said, because when I get home tomorrow, I've got to print some stuff off before we move Monday. And he said, well, I'll do the best I can. And I said, honey, please, you know. And there we are. We all, you know, we all have those, those things, you know. Yours might not be that, but your husband might ask you to do something. And you're like, are you serious? Or even this morning as you're trying to get out the door, he might have asked you to do something. Are you serious? Don't you know I have to be at the ladies' conference at 9 o'clock? And uh, so we have this wrestling going on. Or we might hear the following in a local church, you know, well, well, we can't do it that way. We've always done it this way. We can't change that. We have a difficult time sometimes giving up our rights, don't we? We are very selfish. And we have a hard time of thinking of others as more important than ourselves. And my friend, we are raising a generation that is worse than us. I am appalled at the children that I see today. They are very selfish, self-consumed, and love themselves too much. And you know where they learned it? From us. They learned it from us, right? Now, I'm convinced if we as a church and if we as women would put into practice the verses that we're going to cover right now, I'm convinced our problems would be less in our churches and less in our homes. And I don't know about you, but I don't like problems in my home and I don't like problems in our church. So I'd like to obey these four verses, wouldn't you? 
and have a church that is harmonious and unified and a home that is harmonious and unified. So in fact, uh, our relationships might be just a touch of heaven if we would implement these verses. So let's cover them, let's read them together, and then let's talk about them. Paul says, if there be any, therefore any consolation in Christ, any comfort of love, any fellowship of the spirit, any tender mercies and compassions, fulfill you my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but also on the things of others. Now, you should have an outline there before you. We're going to first of all look at Paul's appeal for unity, and under that, we'll have uh, eight little points there in verses one and two. Then we'll also look at Paul's application for unity in verses three and four, and there will be two points there. So eight on the first and two on the second. Now, we don't have time to get into the context, but just to tell you that as he ended chapter one, if you'll look very carefully, he's talking about suffering and persecution. For unto you it is given on the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but to suffer for his sake. He says, having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. So he's talking about suffering and persecution. Now, ladies, because the church was going through suffering and persecution, it would be imperative that they be unified. Because as you go through troubling times, if there is disunity, it only makes things worse, <laughs> okay? So when you're going through suffering, persecution, trials, if there's disunity in your home, disunity in the body of Christ, it only makes things worse. Many times when we're going through suffering or persecution, tension in relationships can be at their peak and then unity becomes a risk. But ladies, unity in the local church is possible even when you're going through trials and suffering and persecution. You might say, well, Susan, how is that possible? Well, it is possible based on the qualities or the four appeals in verse one. Let's look at it. Appeal number one. Therefore, if there is any consolation of Christ or in Christ. Now, you will notice, look at verse one very carefully. Paul begins each of these appeals with the word if. If there's consolation in Christ, any, if there's comfort, if, if, if. The word if is really translated since or in view of the fact that it is true. Since it is true, ladies, they are, these are realities. These are realities. These things are not questionable. These things are not, oh, I hope so. There is consolation in Christ, right? There is comfort in love. There is fellowship in the spirit. There is tender mercies and compassion. So this isn't an if, it's things that are completely sure. Now, all of these appeals in verse one are gonna begin with the letter C, A, B, C, for your remembrance, okay? First of all, Paul appeals for unity based on, here's your first C, consolation in Christ. Now, what's that mean? Well, the word consolation in the Greek is the act of calling toward or to help or begging someone, call, going alongside of them. And it would include exhortation and encouragement. Paul is saying, since you as a body of Christ have experienced the gentle encouragement of Christ, then you too should live in the same way. You too should live in a state of harmony. You have been granted grace by Christ, his comfort, his encouragement, so you therefore also live in the same way. Ladies, the point is this, there is encouragement in the person of Jesus Christ, is there not? You know, I was thinking as after my husband said that, I, I thought, you know, I started getting upset in my heart and I thought, okay, stop it, Susan. In light of eternity, what does it matter if he unplugs your computer and your printer? You know, I mean, just so you don't get your documents printed tomorrow, it's really not going to matter, right? So stop it. It's really not worth it in light of eternity. It's really not worth it going home and having a fight with your husband. So just stop. That's wicked. That's sinful. The point is this. 
Paul says, because that's true, that Christ does encourage you, comes alongside you, then let us minister to the needs of others and be more concerned about them than, than ourselves. See how selfish we are? We wake up every day and the first thing we think of is what? Ourselves. <laughs> how am, what am I going to feed myself? What am I going to, you know, what am I going to do for myself? And you know, this is a challenge in the middle of persecution because our flesh wants to cry out, poor me, <laughs> you know, <laughs> nobody understands. <laughs> well, the second appeal is for comfort of love. Notice how Paul puts it. If there's any comfort of love, this is your second C. Now, what does this mean? Well, comfort means to speak closely to anyone. And the word for love here is agape, which is the type of love that God showed toward us. It's not a love that is um, mushy-gushy. It's not a love that gives us what we think we uh, you know, want, but what we need. God loved us so much, what? He gave his only begotten son. God gave us what we needed. We needed a savior because we are sinful, right? And so he agape us. Now, ladies, if we have that kind of love in our hearts towards others, then that produces spiritual unity, right? If I love you based on what? What you want, you're going to be a very selfish person. If I enable you, you're going to be a very self-consumed person. But if I love you to the point I give you what you need, then that's true love. Ladies, if we have that kind of love in our hearts, it'll produce spiritual unity in our lives as well as produce comfort, right? In the hour of trial. In fact, I've just had a couple of conversations recently with a couple of friends of mine who enable their children. And I said, you know, you've just raised a brat is all you've done. You've, your kids are brats and they're grown. And they go, I know. I go, why'd you do it? <laughs> There's no comfort in that. There's no comfort in that, but there is comfort in giving. You know, children like boundaries. They really do. They like discipline. I mean, they may not like to be spanked, but they like discipline. They like to know there's rules. Ladies, we agape others based on their needs. Now, notice the third appeal is for communion. Paul puts it this way. Any fellowship of the Spirit. Fellowship is a word which involves participation or communion in anything. That's why I gave it the word communion. But here, it's communion or fellowship of the Spirit. Ladies, the commonality that we have is from the Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit. Everybody in this room that knows the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, we all have one thing in common, right? We have a commonality, right? Yes, are you guys awake? Need more coffee? <laughs> now, I've had two cups, so that's about my limit, but... We have fellowship, right? Communion because of the Holy Spirit. Paul says in Romans 8, 16, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we, what? Are the children of God. So what's Paul saying? If you want to have unity in your church, in your home, we should all share, what? That same commonality of the Holy Spirit, which is, and we know what the fruit of the Spirit is, love. We should all have that same love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, faith and self-control. That should be present in all of us. That's what the Holy Spirit produces. Well, notice the fourth appeal here, for compassion. He puts it this way, any tender mercies and compassion. King James Version describes, it, describes affection as bowels, bowels of compassion. That's kind of a weird term, isn't it? But that describes, you know, when you think of your bowels, you know, it's the inside, your intestines. Uh, so it comes to mean that describing our inward feelings, our inward gut. And mercy here means pity or compassion. What's Paul saying? Ladies, our Christianity should produce sympathy and affection for others. Sympathy and affection. I was just talking to Mark Brashear in the book table room when we were just sharing. I said, you know, we're praying for you. I said, you know, I, I've been there, done that where you are. I have compassion. <laughs> I understand. I understand. Ladies, we should have that sympathy. We should feel the hurts of others. Sympathy and affection. I shared with you yesterday about the lady whose 
was caught in adultery with the, you know, the pastor. I mean, the pastor's wife was caught in adultery, and I've been trying to talk to the other woman involved, the the innocent party. I, I woke up this morning and just kept thinking about her. How, how awful. And praying for the pastor's wife that she re, truly repents. But we should have sympathy. We should have bowels of compassion for one another. Paul reminds the church at Colossae how important these virtues are. Therefore, as elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, humility, kindness, meekness, long-suffering. Well, after Paul gives a fourfold basis for unity, he continues on in verse 2, and we're still appealing for unity, and he gives another fourfold appeal, only this time they're all going to start with the letter L. So you got four C's and four L's, okay? Notice how he begins verse 2. Fulfill my joy. Perfect my joy. What's Paul saying? Well, if you guys will practice all of these things, you will make my joy complete. Ladies, this is every pastor's dream. I know because I'm a pastor's wife. There's nothing more joyful for a pastor and his wife to see a church living out Philippians 1, Philippians 2, 1 to 4. Paul says, this will make my joy complete. But you know what? There's nothing that's more grievous to a pastor and his wife and the elders and their wives than to see a church that's not living these verses out. It's heartbreaking. And ladies, you know, we're going to be accountable on that day. Paul says in Hebrews, obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves to them. Why? Because they watch for your souls. And then he goes on to say on that day, it will be unprofitable for you if they can't present you with joy. You know, so that on that day, your pastor's going to stand up for God, before God and give an account for his sheep that he has shepherded. And hopefully we have obeyed, right? If they've been giving out the goods that they, they should, we've obeyed what they've said. If it's the God's word. And Paul says, you better do that because it's not going to be profitable for you on that day if you have not obeyed. So we want to make sure. And they, we want, I want my pastor, even though he's my husband, to present me with joy, you know? And then I will, you know, describe my middle name, Susan Joy. <laughs> well, he gives another fourfold appeal to unity. And as I said, they all begin with the letter L. Look at the first one. Make my joy complete, first of all, by being like-minded. Like-minded. What does this mean? This means we should have the same goals and be unanimous in our decisions. We should be intent on one purpose. Now, ladies, this does not mean we are unanimous or have the same mind where sin is present. Okay? That's not what Paul is saying. We cannot be like-minded under those circumstances when sin is present. But where sin is not present, what Paul is calling for here is a spirit of unity. We should be like-minded. For example, you might hear, and I've heard of this, of churches splitting over, you know, the color of the carpet or the pastor's salary or the way he raises his children or something petty like that. That is not being like-minded. If we allow discord and strife in the church, then we allow Satan to get a foothold in our church. And ladies, you know that what then happens? It prevents the kingdom of God from being advanced. And Debbie and I have been in very many churches, and I can walk in the door and be up there teaching or start talking to the women, and you know it's a dead church. It's like Ichabod has been written over the door. The glory of the Lord is departed. And when you get, begin to talk to the women or you talk to the pastor's wives, you find out that all this garbage is going on and there is not a spirit of unity. And we don't want to give Satan a foothold because it blasphemes the name of God. In fact, Paul gives this principle to the church at Corinth in 2 Corinthians 13, 11. Finally, brethren, farewell. Become complete. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Be of one mind. Live in peace and the God of peace will be with you. Do you see what he's saying? If you guys are of one mind, and of course we know the church at Corinth wasn't, there was all kind of divisions and strifes and some guy committing incest and they wouldn't put him out of the church. I mean, that, that church was a mess. But Paul says, if you guys would be of one mind, the God of peace will be with you. Now, I don't know about you, but I want God's peace with me. I don't like it when I'm not at peace with God. I don't like that, that feeling in my soul. In fact, nothing is more grievous in a church or an individual. God's hand of blessing has ceased. Notice the second appeal. 
is for love. Not only be like-minded, but he, have, he says, have the same love. This is the same Greek word as in verse 1, agape love. And ladies, it must be very important because he's mentioned it two times now. Two times, love. Anytime anything is repeated in Scripture, it's because it's important. And again, as I mentioned last night, remember he prayed for the church at Philippi that their love would abound more and more, and yet we saw that the church at Philippi already loved Paul and he loved them. And why is he praying for that? Because love is foundational for everything we do. Now what? There's faith, hope, love, and the greatest of these is what? Love. Ladies, there ought to be a continuous love among the believers for one another. We should have the same love for God's word, for his people, for his work. We might differ on opinions. You know, I imagine as this conference went together, there was probably differences on how the program should look, what the program should look like, what color tablecloth should be on the table, what kind of food we were going to have out there, where, you know, there might have been differing opinions, and that's okay. But we should all have what? The same love. And I should defer. Well, it doesn't really matter if the color of the pro, even though that's a great looking program. I think that's one of the best ones I've ever seen. It's really great. Debbie and I were talking about it. It's done with excellence. We might have different opinions, but ladies, we better have the same love. If you want unity in your church, in your home, you better have the same love. Notice the third appeal. The third appeal, Paul says, of one accord. And so this really is a synonym, so don't laugh at me. The appeal, the third appeal is for loan, L-O-N-E, which is a synonym for one. Loan accord, one accord. Now, this is the only time this word is used in the New Testament. Did you know that? One accord. This is the only time you'll find it. And it means a union of soul. We should be joined together in our souls. We should be unanimous. We should have the same urges, the same desires when it comes to God's glory and his kingdom. Ladies, we should all act as if one soul is guiding us. We should be soulmates. Remember what Paul said about Timothy? I have no one like-minded who would naturally care for my state. He was like his soulmate. We all should have the same desire, the same soul. The fourthly, the fourth appeal here is that they would be of lone mind, one mind, one mind, lone mind. The call here is to be intent on one purpose. It implies not only thought, but also the affection, the will. I like what A.T. Robertson says. He says, it's like we're all thinking the one thing. It's like clocks that strike at the same time. Debbie and I had that, I think it was yesterday or the day before, our alarms went off at the same time playing the same tune. I was like, well, that's really weird. <laughs> but that's what he's saying. Clocks that tick at the same time. The same mind, one mind. Identity of ideas, harmony of feelings. You might be saying, Susan, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Those eight things, that's a tall order. I mean, you, you don't know the women in my church. They drive me crazy. I can't, I can't do these things. You know, it is impossible when you think about it to think we would have the same opinions on everything, right? But Paul tells us in verses 3 to 4 how we can be united. How we can. And Paul now gives the church at Philippi and you and me the application for unity. So we move from the appeal, his eightfold appeal for unity, to now the application. Okay, Paul, tell me how. How do I do this? <laughs> how do I fulfill all these things? Notice what he says. Hold on to your hats if you have one on. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. Paul says, let nothing, not one thing, no, nothing, 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 be done through selfish ambition, which is translated strife. In fact, the one strife means someone who works for hire. Selfishness means self-willed. Ladies, strife or contention is always an expression of enmity and results in factions and discords among the brethren. Ladies, that should never be for the life of a believer. Paul says in 2 Timothy 2.24, the servant of the Lord must not quarrel but be gentle to all men, patient. Patient. When you think about our Lord Jesus Christ and you think about his life here on earth, do you ever read in the pages of the New Testament that he allowed such a motive to influence him? Selfish ambition? 
No. <laughs> and neither should we. Now, not only should absolutely nothing be done through strife, but also nothing should be done through conceit. Paul says. Again, the King James Version translates this word as vainglory, which means empty glory, self-conceit, empty pride, a vain opinion of yourself. Ladies, that is not from God. If you have that, you're in big trouble because James says in James 3, 14 to 16, if you have bitter envy and strife in your heart, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom comes not from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonical. For where envy and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. But the wisdom that's from above is what? Pure, peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. So if you've got all this, this stuff going on, James says, don't lie to yourself. That's demonical. That's from the devil. Demonical, ladies. If we're serving God for self-praise, then that is a wrong motive. Self should never enter the picture. Instead of these motives, Paul says we should have a lowliness of mind. A lowliness of mind. What does this mean? This means we should be humble. We should have a humble and modest opinion of ourselves. In fact, it actually is the same word used in Acts 20, 19, where Paul describes his own personal service to the Lord, and he says this, I serve the Lord with all humility with many tears, many trials. Now, there are some really wrong views of humility, okay? And we're talking about humility in this session. Humility, listen very carefully. Humility is not thinking meanly or lowly of yourself. It's just not thinking of yourself at all. Now, that's hard, isn't it? Just not thinking of yourself at all. Having a lowliness of mind does not mean that we go around thinking, oh, you know, I'm just, I'm so humble. Yeah, I just, I'm so humble. <laughs> That's thinking of yourself there, isn't it? It doesn't even, it means you don't think of yourself at all. That's what Paul's calling for here. Don't even think of yourself at all. Now, ladies, this does not mean we're at the beckoning call of everyone, okay? As I mentioned, I don't believe in enabling. Everyone that comes knocking at your door and says, I need this, I need that. James says in another place, you know, if your brother or sister has need and you shut up your heart of compassion from him, how dwells the love of God in you? Actually, that's 1 John. But anyway, the Greek there is in when you, when you, if your brother has need, that you have investigated and made sure it is a need. Okay? It's not just a want, that this person has a legitimate need. And so it doesn't mean we're at the beckoning call of everyone. If we did that, it would be disastrous, right? And then we would raise those little brats. But ladies, we should have an attitude of humility, and we should have a servant's heart seeking to go the extra mile when needed. I believe when we have a right view of ourselves and we see ourselves as vile, insignificant, a sinner saved by the grace of God, unworthy to be called his child, then a proper view of ourselves will lead us to an attitude of humility towards God and others. Ladies, nothing will hurt human relationships more than an attitude of pride. God gives grace to the humble, but he resists the pride. That means his army is set against you, getting ready to fight you. Ooh, I don't know about you. I don't want God against me. <laughs> now, if we truly have the right mindset of ourselves, not thinking of ourselves at all, which is humility, then notice what Paul says. Then we will esteem others better than ourselves. Esteem here means to think or reckon, and the word better means to hold oneself above. We are to think of others better than ourselves. In fact, the Greek translation reads like this. You must rather, in humility, regard one another as more excellent than yourself. So, instead of Susan Joy Hex spending an hour licking her wounds and absorbed in self-pity... I think of somebody else and how I can spend that hour for their benefit and not my own. Now, ladies, that's humility, right? And that's hard. That's the spirit we should have. So, in a nutshell, the first application to unity is die to yourself and live to others. Die to yourself and live to others. What did Jesus say? 
If you want to save your life, you better lose it. If you want to lose your life, you, can, you better, what, Let's see. If you want to save your life, you better lose it. Or lose your life. Okay, wait a minute here. <laughs> I know that passage. Now remember, you have, to, you have to love me and esteem me better than yourself right now. Because I haven't had much sleep. So if I slip on some scripture memorization, it's because my mind is uh, going to bed. He, will, he who will, well, I'm not even going to quote it. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> All right, well, Paul expounds a little further with that thought in verse 4. Look, not every man on his own things, but also on the things of others. Interesting word, look here. It means to look towards an object to actually spy out. In fact, our English word scope comes from this word, not scope the mouthwash, but scoping something out. <laughs> Paul says we should not be absorbed by the concerns of ourselves, but we should be spying out or scoping out other people's needs. I love what Elizabeth Elliot says. This is great. She says, if a marriage counselor were to ask each partner, what are your goals? And the answer was, how can I best serve my husband or my wife? And what can I do to further his or her goals? She said, the counseling period would be over and the bill low. <laughs> Isn't that true? And boy, let me tell you, my husband and I have done a lot of premarital counseling, and I've never heard them say that. What's your goal in marriage? Oh, to see whatever I can do for her, or whatever I can do for it, whatever. And she said the counseling period would be over and the bill low. Wouldn't it be great if we had a, some community of Christians who set themselves to look only to the interest of others? Ladies, then maybe we would adorn the good doctrine of God and make it attractive instead of blaspheming his word and making it unattractive. You know, it's a sad day that we live in when everyone is so preoccupied with himself and themselves and their selves. In fact, have you taken time to listen to your conversations lately? Now, I know this weekend you're going to really focus on being interested in someone else, but <laughs> maybe later on this week or next month you'll think about this lesson. And listen to conversations that you have. I'm always surprised the women that I disciple that I've poured my life into for years and years. And sometimes they'll leave my house or I'll leave their house. And I thought, you know what? We spent, just spent two hours together and they didn't ask me one thing about anything. Now, I'm there to serve them. That's true. But I hope by my example, they're learning that they should be interested in my concerns too and my needs and how they can pray for me. Because usually before I end any discipling time, I'll say, now, how can I pray for you before we meet again? And it's only one or two that'll say, well, how can I pray for you, Susan? So start taking, taking note of your conversations you have with people and note how much you spend talking about yourself or your grandkids or your, 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 whatever. Me, 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 me. That's why they call it iPads, iPhone, I, 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 because it's all about I. <laughs> And note how many times you and how much time you spend asking others about their, in, and really meaning it, okay? Not just doing it. That's hypocrisy if you don't mean it, okay? You know, we live in a world that tells us we need to fulfill our desires. We need to love ourselves. I say, where is that in the Bible? Show me that in the Bible. Jesus says, love your neighbor as you already do yourself. You already do love yourself. That's the problem. Ladies, we're to be looking out for the interests of others. We need to look out for the spiritual interests of the church, the body. We need to scope out the needs of others, the poor, the fatherless, the widows. We need to look out for the needs of the sinner and seek to win them to the Savior. Now, let me stop and say here, this does not mean we look out for one another by being busybodies. Gossiping, slandering, again, Facebook is a great conduit for that. In fact, my son has said, Mom, you don't want, I don't have a Facebook account, so don't try to find me on there. But, um, and I know several women that have gotten off just for that reason. But he says, Mom, you don't want to get on there because some of the women you disciple, you don't want to know what they're writing. And I said, don't tell me. I don't want to know. It would just break my heart. They're using Facebook as a conduit for gossip, slander. That's not what Paul's saying when he says scope out the interests of others. That doesn't mean we're a busybody in other people's matters. Paul says, I will the younger women get married, bear children, rule the house, give no occasion for the adversary to speak reproachfully. For some are already turned aside after to Satan. 
And they're taught walking from house to house, being busybodies, speaking things they shouldn't talk about. And now we have a much more modern way of doing that. We don't have to walk to each other's house. We just get our cell phone or whatever and we start texting. We gossip that way. But ladies, we should be tenderly concerned for the needs of others and less consumed with ourselves. So the second application to unity is scope out the interest of others. Scope out the interest of others. Now let's quickly go over everything we've learned. Paul's appeal for unity in verses 2, 1 to 2, his first fold appeal, first fourfold appeal is for consolation, comfort, communion, compassion. Second, Secondly, like-mindedness, love, lone accord, lone mind. His application, how do you do this? How do you do those eight things? <laughs> Die to yourself and live for others. And scope out the interests of others. You might be saying, Susan, well, how, do, how does all this flesh out? I mean, how does this really work? Well, I read about a man one time who pastored a church in the 1800s. And his life was incredible, an incredible story of a shepherd who pastored a church. In fact, they had 50 years, this man pastored the same church for 50 years, and they always had harmony in those 50 years. Now, listen to what he says. Our fellowship has been ever growing, and during its 59 years, of continuing, there was never strife or bitterness between us. Of course, this is 1800 language, okay? The dear departed one was wont to say, ah, oh, dear brother, we never had a jar. I mean, it's not a jar, but an argument, okay? We can daily contributed each to the other's treasure of grace and truth. We were touching the guidance of our steps, the ordering of our ways, the rule of our household. We always waited on God together for his mind. If we did not agree, we waited on God to give us oneness of mind, and neither of us ever took a step against the judgment of the other. Hence, no strife, no bitterness. Can you imagine? Sounds too good to be true, right? And yet, that is the way the body of Christ should function. Can you imagine how God's glory and power would be manifested in our churches today if these verses alone would be apl applied in every Sunday school class, every youth department, every nursery department, every women's ministry department, every choir, every elder board, and every ministry throughout the church? What about your home? Could you imagine if these four verses were applied in your home? Can you imagine how it would change your marriage? Your relationship with your kids, your grandkids, even your neighbors, your community. So it's one of the things I'm looking forward to is moving into a new neighborhood because the one I live in now, I don't know. They just don't like the fact that my husband's a pastor. We've tried to have people over and in our home and share the gospel. And man, as soon as they found out Doug was a pastor, it's like, ugh, not want nothing to do with you. So I'm praying that God will give me opportunities in my new neighborhood. But can you imagine if, if these verses were lived out in your neighborhood, your friendships? Ladies, it would be such a light to a lost world. They would truly say, behold, how they love one another. What did Jesus say? By this will all men know you are my disciples if you what? love one another. Maybe we would actually see revival in our churches. Maybe we'd see revival in our country. Wouldn't that be great? A country that's going, to, going down so fast. Ladies, with God's help, will you determine with me to follow the pattern set forth for each of us in Philippians 2, 1 to 4? Will you, with God's help, die to yourself and live for others? Let's pray. Oh, Father in heaven, I thank you so much for Paul's call to unity, Paul's call to humility. And Lord, apart from your grace and your spirit, we cannot do this. There's no way. Because, Father, we are consumed with ourself. We are so completely selfish. And we fight and, and bicker with one another to get our own way. We're teaching our children the same thing by our examples. And, Father, I just pray that you'll show us how to practically live these verses out. Because, Father, we even know that you came not to be ministered to, but to minister and to give your life a ransom for many. 
So help us, Father, help us to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow you. In Christ's name, amen.